Welcome to AB Chemistry at Honega High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at some extra help getting ready for the Chapter 6, 7, and 21 test. Now, through the course of the discussion, we're going to look at some errors and misconceptions students have related to these different situations. So there's a number of things that in the past I've seen students struggle with. So go through and we'll take a more in-depth look at each of these situations. First one, watch your units. Single most important thing in the whole set of chapters when we're dealing with energy and we deal with energy in every single chapter. Remember energy is units of joules and joules must be kilograms for mass, meters for length, and seconds for time every single time. So if we're calculating an energy, we have to get to joules. We've got to be in kilograms. Remember that. And also pay attention, does it ask for kilojoules? And does it ask for joules or kilojoules per mole? So always, always, always be careful with units, like always in AP. Next, before we would talk about how this is um, numbers from a quantum number point of view, but the ideas, even though we're not dealing with numbers, are still ideas you need to have clear in your head. So knowing the relationships between quantum numbers is really now knowing the relationships between energy level, sublevel, and orientation. First, N is energy level. And remember, we can have energy levels 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, technically up to infinity. Now, we never talk about more than seven because if we look at our elements in our periodic table, we have a limited number of electrons. We don't need more than seven energy levels to discuss where those electrons are at in their ground state. But technically, yes, there's an infinite number. Now, one bizarre idea related to this is while there's an infinite number, we don't worry about an infinite number of energy levels because as we go from the first to the second, to the third, they start getting closer and closer and closer together. And the concept of limits in math class, eventually, if we had just a little bit more energy, instead of going to a higher level and sublevel, we're actually going to jump out of the atom entirely. We're going to ionize it. And there's a finite number of energy levels then we really worry about because this limit idea as those energy levels get closer and closer and closer together. Next idea, you should understand the relationship between N and several different things. First, N tells you how many sublevels you've got. On the first energy level, you have one sublevel. On the second energy level, you have two. You have the S and the P sublevel. On the third, you have three, the S, the P, and the D sublevel. So you should understand there's a relationship between N, what it is on the level you're on, and how many sublevels. Basically, it's the same thing. If you're on the first level, you got one sublevel. Second level, you got two sublevels. Third, you got three sublevels. Technically, yes, that means on the fifth level, you have five sublevels. So why do we never talk about the fifth sublevel? Same reason we never talk about more than seven energy levels. When we're looking at ground state electron configurations, we never need more than the F sublevel. But yes, there are other sublevels that exist out there by the math. Next thing you should understand that there's a relationship between and, and how many sublevels you have on a level. Um, or I should say that is the, the one, two, three. So on the fifth, you have five sublevels. Next, you can know the relationship between the n and the number of orbitals. If you square n, that tells you very quickly how many total orbitals you have um, on that whole level, the entire shell. So if you're on the third energy level, three squared is nine. We've got our one s, our three p's, and our five d's. That's a total of nine. So it's a quick, easy way to figure it out. And yes, once again, that means on the fifth, we technically have 25 total orbitals. And then since there's two electrons per orbital, 2n squared would give us the number of electrons possible on an energy level. Next idea past n is dealing with shape. Remember, shape would be our SPDF. Technically, these have numbers associated with it, but we're not really going to get into those real numbers. What we're going to talk about is a different set of numbers. S, the first time you see it, is on the first level and every level after that. First time we have a P is the second, first time we have a D is the third, and first time we have an F is the fourth and beyond. So remember, SPDF 1, 2, 3, 4, that's how we block off our periodic table. Next, orientation. Remember, on our S, P, D, and F sublevels, we can have different orbitals, a different number of apartments, so to speak, that electrons can live in. And once again, there's a pattern here. S, there's only one. P, there is three. D, there is five. And F, there is seven. So what is this mysterious fifth sublevel that would go here? Well, who cares what it is? We know it's going to have nine orientations for whatever it is. I think it might be the G. So you should understand the relationships between these various levels, shapes, and orientations. And when you put it together, we get diagrams that look like this. Now, if we have a simplified view of what we just talked about, that's what we've got here on the left. And this is actually what the hydrogen atom would look like. 
So on our first, we have the 1S. On our second, we have the 1S and the 3Ps. On the third, we have the 1S, the 3Ps, and the 5Ds. And this is what I mean by orientation. We've got five different Ds on this sublevel. And then the Fs, we would have seven. Now, if we only had one electron, that's exactly what the atom would look like. But on only hydrogen do we have only one electron. Every other atom is going to look like what we have over here. So this is really what our apartment building looks like inside the atom. So 1s would be our lowest energy level, and then next would be the 2s, and then after that we have our three 2p apartments, and then 3s, and then 3p. So far so good. Next is where it starts to get odd. After the 3p's, next highest energy is the 4s, then we get to our five 3d's. Well, how do you remember that? Well, remember we talked about how you can block off the periodic table, and you can use that to see what comes next in terms of energy level. So that's by far the easiest way to see that. Now, once or now that we've got this picture here, I want to briefly talk about what we're actually going to see on the next slide. Offbow just says we have to add lowest energy first. So first we're going to fill here, and then here, and then here, and so on. That's offbow. Next lowest in energy level. Hun's rule. It's easy to see when you've got this kind of diagram. Well, first electron, second electron, third, fourth, fifth would go here. Hun's rule says when we're adding electrons to a sublevel at the same energy, we have to put one in each before any get two. So our sixth electron would have to go in there. And that's because to put two electrons in the same orbital, we have electron-electron repulsion. That's going to be a higher energy situation. It's lower energy to put one in each apartment in the sublevel before any of them get two. So adding to our 3Ds is also going to be a Hun's level. So we'd put one there, then one there, then one there, then one there, then one there. And then finally, the sixth electron in would go in that first apartment, the down electron. So that's Hun's rule. So when we look at understanding our three rules, off bow, we just talked about that. Lowest first, block periodic tables, easy way to see that. Hun's rule, when you're on a sublevel, each one must have one before any gets two. And the reason there is about energy, so it's related to the concept of off -bow. And then finally, Pauli exclusion principle. When we did quantum numbers, this made a little more sense written this way. No two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers or the same four bits of quantum information. Well, if we're not using quantum numbers, what it really means is when you're looking at, let's say, here is a D sublevel. So I've got my fifth level Ds. And these would be my 5D orbitals. Now, if I'm looking at this electron in that orbital on that sublevel, it's a fifth energy level, so n would equal 5. It's in a D-shaped orbital, and it's in my third orientation. So it's in the third orientation of an orbital. Now, it's the first one in, so it's going to be our positive one-half spin situation. If we had another electron in that same orbital, it's still going to be fifth energy level. It's still going to be D, and it's still going to be in our third apartment. But we have to have a unique set of quantum information about that electron. So notice we put it as a down arrow instead of an up arrow. So that means its spin quantum number is going to be different. Now, let's say we were talking about an electron here and an electron here. Now, the black electron is still on the fifth energy level. It's still in a D, but it's in the first orientation with a positive one-half spin. But the red electron, still in the fifth level, still in a D, but it's in the second orientation. So it will have unique quantum information. So not all four bits of information, level, shape, which orientation, and which spin can be the exact same for any two electrons. And that's really the Pauli exclusion principle. And long and short of it, what it means is you're always going to go up, down in the same orbital. Next, recognize ground state versus excited state. This is surprisingly difficult for students. Keep it simple. Is this a ground state or excited state? Well, you could take a look at what we've got here and add up the electrons. That's what you do. Just add your electrons. So the numbers on top, 2 plus 2 plus 5 plus 1. Well, that's a total of 10 electrons. What's got 10 electrons? Well, neon's got 10 electrons, and neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Is that what we have written here? No, apparently what's happened is one of our p electrons got elevated up to a third level s, and we then have an excited state. So really, the number of electrons tell you what atom you've got. So count up the superscripts, and you can see what atom we're talking about. And write the electron configuration in the ground state for that and see if they differ. 
If it differs, you definitely have an excited state situation. So keep it simple when you're talking about excited state. Count your electrons. Next, writing electron configurations after ionizations have occurred. Now, there's a couple of different ways this can be described. So um, if they talk about forming the cation or talking about doing one and two ionizations, really it's the same idea. You have a neutral atom. You're removing an electron from it when you're ionizing it. So you're going to end up with a plus one ion and an electron as your other product. So this is what the first ionization of magnesium looks like. It's going to form Mg plus and E minus. Now, if you want to find out the electron configuration for Mg plus, I always recommend you start by writing the neutral atom because you can see exactly what you've got. And really all you need is your orbital, or I should say your noble gas configuration. Less garbage to write, easier to see what's happening. And realize I'm taking an electron out of there. Well, when I take an electron out, instead of 3s2, it's going to be 3s1. So when you go to write your electron configuration for a cation, start with the atoms electron configuration, and then remove electrons. Now, this is a pretty simple one. We don't have a D sublevel. There's no P electrons on the valence level. But realize, if we did have P electrons on our valence level, we would first pull from the P. And if all those are gone, then we would pull from the S. And if all those are gone and we need to pull more, we're now going to go to our next lower level, D, and pull. So if we have something like tin, tin's going to have S, P's, and D's. The S and the P's would be on the valence level. We pull from those first. And then if we needed to remove them more, we would pull from the D's if we had to. So keep in mind, pull from the P's on the valence level, then from the S's on the valence level. And if you have to take more, then start pulling from the D's. Now, after another ionization, it's going to become... So if we ionize this, then we're going to get Mg2 plus, plus an electron. Well, if we look at that electron configuration, we've got our neon core. We've lost our valence level. If we're going to pull a third electron out by Coulomb's law, we've got a lower level N. We're much closer to the nucleus, significantly harder to pull out that electrons. So we're going to see at this point a huge jump in ionization energy. And that tells us that magnesium is going to form as a stable ion, the plus two ion. Because to, to pull a third, it's just cost prohibitive from an energy standpoint. Next idea, know all your trends and why. So ionization energy, electronegativity, metallic character, um, atom and ion size, those are our typical trends. Now, we also talked about um, nuclear strength effect, nuclear strength, and screening effect as kind of trends. But the big five are the ones I just listed. Remember, every one of those five is caused in the period by increasing effective nuclear strength. So if you're going to answer a question justifying a trend and it's a period trend, you better use this phrase. Increasing effective nuclear charge causes blank. Nucleus gets stronger then, so it pulls the electrons. The atom and ion size are smaller. Ionization energy and electron activity go up. Same exact reason. So start by using this phrase. You must have this phrase. That's the key phrase we're looking for. Now, if we're talking about a group trend in any of them, this is what you must have. Increasing N causes blank. Because as you go down a group, you're always increasing your value of N. Now, you, there are two different situations here. One, it could be talking about size. So in a size situation, what you need to say is, well, greater N, farther from the nucleus, it's bigger. And then the force situation, ionization energy, electronegativity, metallic character, those type of things. Increasing N, so greater N, because of Coulomb's law, would cause the force of attraction to decrease. So farther from the nucleus, lower ionization energy, lower electronegativity, and so on. Um, higher metallic character. So within a group, it's about greater N. And remember, that could be in a size situation. Greater N causes farther from the nucleus. And from a force energy point of view, greater N means weaker attractive forces because you're farther from the nucleus, Coulomb's law. Number seven, put this in here because sometimes students forget something that they were supposed to remember from last year. Ionic compounds are positive and negative charge things, and those positive and negative charges are close together. By Coulomb's law, those are strong attractions. These things are going to be solids at room temperature because they're held together by positive and negative ions with strong attractions. Molecules are much weaker intermolecular forces, so those are much more likely going to be a gas, or if it's large enough, maybe a liquid. And yes, if it gets really big, it can be a solid. But typically, molecular things held together by much weaker forces, they're going to be gases, maybe liquids at room temperature, whereas your ionic compounds are always going to be solids. 
And in chapter 7, we got into trends on the periodic table of things. Okay, number 8, half-life problems. Remember, these two equations that are listed here are on the AP constant sheet. Know when and how to use them. Be careful. There's a third one that's for second-order kinetics. Radioactive decay is not second-order kinetics. So ignore that third equation. Never, ever, ever use it until we get into a chapter in second semester. Now, before you jump into your problem, it's always worth your time to say, is this a simple question? Because sometimes you can dramatically speed up the question if you catch, oh, it's going through three half-lives. So it's six half uh, years of half-life. That's 18 years old. Or it went through three half-lives, and we started with 100 grams. So after three half-lives, we're going to get down to 50 after one, then 25, and then at 12 and a half. So that's how much we got to have left after three half-lives. So always ask yourself, is it a simple half-life problem? Is it a divide by two situation? Because you can really save yourself some time. Now, if it's not a simple one, they're going to be asking you one of two things. How long did it take to decay or how much is left? Now, remember, we're using our same base equation up above, but if it's looking at how long did it take, we're solving for t. Now, a naught is how much you start with, a t is how much you have at the end, and k is our rate constant. And remember, to solve for k, that's the whole reason why we have this equation right here, is if they give us the half-life, we can solve for k, and then we can plug that into that bottom equation here. So remember, that's how you get K. Another thing while it's up here, quick reminder, A can be mass, they can be the number of particles, and they can also be the number of disintegrations in a given amount of time. But what's always going to be true is A naught is your initial situation. It's always going to be a bigger number every single time. So this one will always be smaller. This one will always be bigger every, every, every single time. Next, how much it's left? Really kind of the same idea. If they tell us the half-life, we can use that top equation to figure out what our k is. And then we can plug it into this solve form of this equation and find out what at is. But be careful. If you're just solving for the ln of at, that's not the right answer. That's the natural log of the right answer. So to get rid of the natural log, we have to use e to the and do it on the left. You also do it on the right. And we end up with at equaling that. So be careful if you're being asked how much is left, and you have to do the math. Remember, you're going to be using the LN key, and you're going to be using the E key before all said and done. And the last idea is nuclear decay reactions. We've got four fundamental nuclear decay reactions. You should be able to write them all. So let's say it's an alpha decay. Well, if I've got uranium-238 and it's undergoing an alpha decay, I need to know what an alpha particle is. Well, that's 4 over 2He. Now, to finish this off, to balance this equation, remember, the mass numbers on each side have to equal, the atomic number have to equal. So 4 plus what equals 238? Well, that's 234. 2 plus what equals 92? Well, that's 90. And if you look up on your periodic table, once we know atomic number, we can find out the substance. In this case, it's thorium. So that would be the balanced nuclear reaction for the alpha decay of uranium-238. Now, let's say this product, so this is our parent nuclide, it became this. Well, what happens if this undergoes another decay, like let's say a beta decay? Well, a beta decay means that's going to be on the product side. We rewrite in our reactant because we're taking 234 and decaying it. And remember, the basic idea here is the same as above, but be careful that negative 1. 0 plus what equals 234? Well, that's 234. Negative 1 plus what equals 90? Well, that's 91. Be very, very, very careful there. And once we know it's 91, we can look it up and see that's PA. Now, not only should you be able to do these two decays, don't forget you should also be able to do electron capture and positron emission. In electron capture, that's just going to be on the reactant side. And in positron emission, 1 over 0 e, our positive electron, will be on the product side. And then you do the exact same thing you did before. Now, the last one I want to look at here is when we have a nuclear transmutation. So a man-made synthetic reaction that's occurring. Now, keep in mind, if we have a missing particle, to find the missing particle, we do what we did before. But be careful, we've got more garbage to worry about bigger numbers. So a calculator may become useful if you really feel you need to. And then watch out for coefficients. 3, 1 over 0 ends really means we have 3 over 0. So we've got on top a total of 236 and 142 plus 3 plus what? is going to equal our 236. And then on the bottom, same thing, but now we don't have to worry about that 3 because it's 3 times 0. So on the bottom, we would have 92 on this side 
and 56 plus what is going to equal 92 on that side. And as it turns out, our missing particle would be 91 over 36 krypton. So if you're doing a nuclear transmutation, it's a little bit different, but the same fundamental ideas of balancing apply. And always, 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 if you've got neutrons, watch out for the coefficient because that can trip you up. And that ends our help notes over our Chapter 6, 7, and 21 test. Good luck. I hope you do well.